pressure of having to move constantly. Yeah. So uh, that that is the, the the one good part of it. But then then is the the sometimes despair of of not having the freedom to go out and uh, the extreme worry of uh, what could be a health issue. So yeah. we're in a very um, a very historic time that you know this will be in the history books for many 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 generations i mean for all of time i'm sure this this is big you know that's true so, i know you are you are i mean you are on the tour all the time i see your posts all the time in europe us yeah. you are traveling crazy yeah it's and insane it's, so it's uh, hard. in a way uh, i kind of like that i don't have to be somewhere and i could do anything uh you know without pressure right now uh, always the worry of oh, i gotta get ready for this or ready for that you know? so that's that's a nice relief <laughs> that's right that's right sir thank you for joining me and uh agreeing for this and uh it's a blessing for me that doing this a conversation since uh all the musicians it's for a musician part it's very hard time because uh okay. Some uh, musicians are uh, out there, and uh, their uh, bread and butter is only, you know, concerts. So yeah, I know. It's well, a, it's, it's the really same. Hard. It's the same for every, every musician. Um, you know, uh, to be not working for this long period of time is uh, there's never been a precedent for this, and. Uh, it's very, very difficult. I've had uh, three, four tours canceled until the fall. And the fall is like, you know, it just seems like years away. and so far from now. Right. You have to go through the whole summer, summer with nothing. You know, we, mm -hmm. we only make that money from live shows. Yeah. Uh, rec record sales are, have not been, you know, I lived through the greatest era of record sales in the 70s and 80s when when the record business was incredibly great until yeah. this horrible streaming thing came in i know i know, <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> it's a, oh my god so more and more musicians rely on live gigs and so we we don't have uh any income from uh let's say if, if you work for a corporation Corporation mm -hmm. might pay you to be home, you know, and work from home, but this is not the same for most musicians, you know. Yes, that is true. That is true. Very uh, tough. So I, uh, I just had a few questions about like being a drummer, and wanted to know about the uh, little bit about Western world and the the world you come from, the guitar world, and also a lot of things you play. So wanted to ask you that. Uh, uh, if you don't mind asking you a few questions and going with this conversation a little bit, uh, yeah. wanted to know what, where, where, uh, before you started, you know, your career path as a professional guitar player, where, uh, what, where, where did you learn playing guitar and all that when, when you started as a, you know, kid as a guitar, when that started first time? I wanted to know always. Well, I, I, it was definitely before I was 10, I would say, uh, uh, after I got out of the hospital, I was in the hospital for two months with a very ser serious uh, injury of my head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I escaped uh, dying. And yeah. cool. uh, I, when I got out, I had this, like unbelievable urge to to play music to mm -hmm. to get more involved with with music so uh, luckily uh, in this situation i had a a sister still have a sister who's seven years older than me and okay. she was the one bringing all the records home you know and uh, all the at the time a lot of 45s and also long playing uh albums mm -hmm. vinyls so you know, I, I got exposed to a lot of what was kind of the hit music at the time. Mm -hmm. my, my, parent, my parents had the classical music and my sister had the pop music and all of it. All of it that was emerging in the 60s was, the early 60s was so, was so uh, 
mind blowing. It was like a whole new movement of sound from, uh, you know, the Beach Boys, Adventures, the Beatles, yeah. you know, and wow. uh, I became, of course, I became a Beatle freak, you know, and I, and, but I also loved a lot of what was coming out uh, progressively from London in particular. Yeah. And, uh, and also the LA scene had, had their, a uh, wonderful little scene there with groups like the Birds, and and then San Francisco had their psychedelic bands, and I love I loved yeah you know, three or four of them a lot. Oh, so yeah. um, I had the, the 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 wonderful proximity, you know, geographically, since I since it was only a half an hour into New York City mm -hmm. uh, to to catch a lot of these shows when I was in in my, my school years. And we would go to a place called the Fillmore East. And if any of you have never heard of the Fillmore East, you should look it up on Google. Okay. Uh, and it was the most incredible theater down in Greenwich Village, right between Greenwich Village and the East Village uh, on 2nd Avenue. And uh, okay. second, it was like 2nd Avenue, and I think it was 4th or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, just an incredible period of time because the air, just the air was filled with music, even on the way to the theater, that whole area, uh, the whole hippie thing and, and music coming out of every shop and incense. And it was just an, an amazing, uh, blow, you know, mind blowing experience for a 15, 16 year old kid, you know, coming in from the suburbs of New Jersey. So I absorbed a lot of amazing shows. Uh, I hung out in Latin clubs. I went to jazz clubs. Uh, I, I, I just absorbed a lot of stuff. And, you know, at the same time, uh, or prior to that, when I was, you know, nine, 10 years old, I had uh, the good fortune of taking guitar lessons uh, from mm -hmm. the local music shop, like right up the block. And mm -hmm. they had assigned me an amazing uh, jazz, old school jazz player uh, that really gave me the best of both worlds because he was. He was also, you know, digging, you know, the more harmonically beautiful Beatle pieces. So and not only did I get the training in, in a lot of jazz uh, from him, because that's, that's what he was all about. But yeah. I also, uh, you know, I got I got to learn some of the songs that uh, in different chord inversions, different scales and uh, different picking techniques that all had to do with alternate picking. Uh, and it all kind of helped for me to develop a base uh in my playing so that by the time I got to Berkeley I was already uh I was already a pretty good reader and I and I knew a lot about uh harmony and I knew a lot about scales and so uh they had actually asked me if I wanted to teach there um, but I was really not interested at all because there was so much more to learn mm -hmm. I mean I mean the way I look at it now is still so much to learn you know so Right. I, I wasn't. I wasn't there for anything other than to learn. <laughs> because you're a hot person. I didn't last that long, you know. Before I got a call from Chick Corea and to join Return to Forever. Return so that to was... Forever. Yes. Yes. Wow. So the, as you you're saying that about Return to Forever, I wanted to ask you uh, because you had that Return to Forever, and then uh, you know fr uh, Friday night in San Francisco, and all this little tur turning moment in your life. So do you have any memory in with uh, Chick Corea and uh, or uh, John McLaughlin or, uh, or Paco, de, Paco de Lucia? Because you were touring with them in Europe a couple of months or something. So you were, you were always with them. And uh, you, I think I've I enjoyed you, you know, playing with them. That's my first video I saw you playing, uh, I mean, you playing uh, in India when I had that internet and YouTube, that was the first time I saw you playing. So from since, I wanted to, you know, always had that urge to, you know, play with you and, you know, but when I met you first time last, last year, uh, I met you for the recording. And I, I before that, I sent you a message that, would you like to, you know, know, can I play tabla sometime for you or something like that? And you replied, yes, interested. And I sent you a few recordings and you, 
you know, you kind of approved <laughs> being there. That's how it works. That's how it works. If you don't ask, <laughs> you'll never know. Right? And uh, I mean, it's, you're, just you're, a, it's just a dream. I don't know how it happened, but it's what you were, it was, it was just perfect moment for me. It was, uh, yeah, it was one of those things, you, you know, you, your, your attitude was just perfect. Uh, and you just get a sense of what you read, you know. So the way you phrased your reading uh, correlates to the way you play. You just have the right way, you know. So you had the right way in. <laughs> I, was, you know, I was. It's sort yeah. of like with, you had, a, you had, you had, a, it wasn't about anything other than you would like to play and add something to my music. And it was the same with me with Chick because with me, I would have, I would have paid to play with Chick Corea, mm -hmm. not the other way around. It was for me, it was my favorite band at the time. And uh, when he called me up and I was living in, uh, in, in an apartment right in the Berkeley area. And he, he basically asked me to join the band. And uh, of course I was, I was just blown away because it was my favorite group. And I wound up going back, uh, down to New York and uh, rehearsing for two or three days. And we played right. Carnegie York, sold out. But that's what Chick liked about, he liked my attitude. My attitude was the thing that, that was, because if you can go in there kind of with, with a cocky attitude or, you know, or it's, well, it's all about money with a gig when you're just starting out, it just turns right. the guy off. So it was, uh, he, he told me that was the most impressive thing to keep, keep him going uh, other than the playing, you know? Yeah. So I, I had never played with a Sable player. Okay. Never. But I do know that uh, I had uh, wanted to include on this new collection of Beatle work, uh, on the new record that's now out, it's called uh, Across the Universe. Yes. And uh, what you added was absolutely beautiful. I just, one of the rare times I let someone just go, because usually I have a very preconceived, preconceived idea of like exactly what I want rhythmically or something, but uh, you just took the ball and ran with it. So you played <laughs> all the way through the piece, and uh, if you know that I'm also a percussionist and I, I can never play tabla. This is, that's a whole other beautiful art form. And you played it so incredible. So I wound up keeping some of my percussion and put it on one side and you come out the other side. And it's, it's actually, it actually works even though we come from two different worlds. But, but I do remember there was, there was um, an Indian element to, to Norwegian yeah. with the original. Um, which, you know, with the sitar and everything, and I know they've worked with Tabla before, and they've worked with Ravi Shankar, and, and I thought all of that was so mind-bending at the time when I was a kid. Uh, here, was, here was a kid listening to world music, not even knowing what, what the term meant. Yes. And uh, it was so different than the rest of the Beatles. So when you really analyze the Beatles, especially their later records, you, you, you really understand that they, they were going into areas that were um, trend setting and, and uh, set the bar very high by adding yeah. classical, classical instruments, uh, world music instruments, uh, sound effects. And they had the luxury uh, that we don't have, we, none of us have, uh, which is to quit touring and only go to the studio every day. Wow. They had enough of touring. In the mid-60s, mid they said, that's it. We're not going out on the road because nobody can hear us with all the girls screaming. So <laughs> what's, the, what's the point of playing? They, nobody can hear what we're doing. It's all screams. So they just decided to, to just craft their music and go to, the, go to work every day in the studio. And yeah. what they turned out was amazing, you know. Wow, yeah. So this is my, my tribute to them, you know. Yeah, and that's the perfect tribute. I mean, the the way you played on the album. So, wanted to ask you one question. I always ha had that you came up with the Beatles album. The Beatles, uh, basically, the you didn't have words, but the, uh, everybody had. When when you listen to the song, you have all the time words in your head. So, and the second thing, the rhythm. It's, it's perfect the way you play drums on it. I know you did. 
and it was so simple but it was so perfect and the th third thing uh, when i heard the yesterday song it's it's so soothing and it's so musically sublime it's so amazing to listen to that how did you come up with this idea to play this on the guitar which one the all the songs without words because words are very strong in the beatles but still okay it appeals well, to you it appeals to you well the thing is when you uh when you listen to the beatles a lot of the songs uh uh over the course of their their whole you know eight to ten years um yeah especially the earlier years the, a lot of the songs were two minutes or less or slightly more but not much more mm -hmm. so you never sat there and said oh my god that's so short it's it just sounded precise uh like like it was a all encompassing in that two minutes, like like Norwegian Wood, for instance. Norwegian Wood is actually, I think, a little under two minutes, but <laughs> you wouldn't think about that. Yeah, yeah. It just sounded so great. Uh, it's so you know concise, but but perfect pop song and and totally memorable by everyone all over the world. Yep. Not only the main melody, but also the also the chorus. Okay, so so. What you do in a piece like that, or a piece like uh, I don't know, uh, Hey Jude, when you when you listen to Paul play piano, for instance, right? Paul is playing quarter note, quarter note chords, quarter note harmony, bang, bang, bang. Then he sings this beautiful melody over this quarter note thing. Now, yeah. if I'm to take the voice out, uh -huh. which of course I have to because I'm not singing. So you limit, you don't have now the, the, the lyrics and that beautiful voice. Uh, and what you have is just that, that quarter note thing. I can't get away with that. Yeah. No way. So I have to do my thing. My thing is to take the rhythm and do something different with it. Yeah. So, but my intention was to keep the melodies more intact on this second, you know, Beatles uh, collection. And, and not displace the melody so much mm -hmm. so that people really get, oh, this is, oh, there it is. That's the song. Okay, got it. But yeah. underneath, underneath is all the kind of um, originality, let's say, uh, that I bring to it. Mm -hmm. uh, or my own, not originality, but my own, just my own flavor, you know, and my own uh, thing that I've developed rhythmically. Because I come, you know, I'm not a, I'm not your typical guitarist in the sense that, you know, I really come from a percussion influence. You know, I, I, I'm a percussionist. Really. You are totally, totally, because you were showing me so many different rhythms <laughs> while playing Norwegian Wood and end of the song, also Strawberry Field. You, you were showing me what, what happens in the end and what should your approach should be in the end and what to do. But the rhythm. Yeah. Fit it fitted so perfectly that was perfectly locked in that the which you were directing me. Right. Uh, when uh, when, you, when you told me to play that part. I mean, I I I love playing percussion uh, a lot, and uh, but definitely tabla is a whole a whole different science. And uh, I would never even attempt to play tabla because you know it really is a study that you've you have to learn all your life. Just like just like flamenco guitar. I mean, I'm I've played with Paco, and yep. and we have similarities in our feeling of Latin music, and so we can do like really cool things. We've done cool things together, but I can you know when someone says, oh, you know, you're uh, I love your flamenco playing. I mean, they they really don't know what they're talking about because I'm I'm not. I didn't come from flamenco, you know. I I have taken influences of certain things for sure, and I've made, put them in my own kind of a capsule. But uh, definitely, uh, you know, this you have to come from uh, a life of playing, like I'm sure you have. And right. uh, but as far as all the other percussion, I mean, I I would say that. I come from more of a Latin side because I really absorbed as a teenager a lot of Latin music, hanging out in clubs. But more importantly, I, I spent a lot of my school years just just 
playing on top of the school desk <laughs> rhythm. And what I would do is I would tap under the desk, very simply, just the chord note. On top of the desk, yeah. I would play counter rhythms. Uh oh. And the whole point, the whole point was, and the whole point even now is, you must tap when you play. Yes. Because it's all the counter rhythms or the, you know, the counterpoint or the counter rhythms, the syncopation yep. that cannot influence, the upper body cannot influence the lower body. And this is when I do clinics, I get into this aspect and everybody's looking at me like, what, what is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, everybody just tap your foot, tap it and then sing counter rhythms against it. Either sing or play counter rhythms and watch right. every yeah. foot go off time. Every it's foot not, goes off time. Yeah, yeah, because, I would like to tell you. Letting, you know what I mean? You're letting the upper body influence the lower and mm -hmm. that's, that's yeah. not a good thing. Yeah. yeah. So. I would, I would like to tell you that tabla players do the same. Really? Yeah, when, when I'm playing, my, my right foot will go like that sometime. If I weren't playing little complex rhythms, like if I go, right. it go, it goes, it goes. The the rhythm sometimes doesn't go in your brains while playing, so tapping foot always works. Which you're right. saying, it's absolutely. I, I mean, the way you play guitar, a guitar comes with the melody. And it's very hard. It's, it's very hard it's to essential. keep up with that. Very, very hard. And and, and if you, you can get very deep into the subject with people uh, that are not aware of it. They just they they more often play with a drummer and they rely on the drummer for time or they rely on a click track or whatever or a rhythm machine. But mm -hmm. you have to discover if yeah. you have the ability to play syncopation against the time not everyone has it it's uh it's you have to discover whether you you have it or not it's not something you can uh develop you either have it or you don't have it it's it's a really awful thing to say because you can develop everything else in music like harmony and you know and the, the all other aspects learning music of any other kind uh uh, the theory of music is all a learned process, hmm. but but rhythm is is the kind of rhythm I'm talking about. And I think you understand is uh, something that's inbred. And I've talked to su supreme musicians from uh, like Cuba, like a guy, guy like Gonzalo Rubalcaba. Yeah. Who uh, we've talked about this subject. He goes, and he would, he normally a very quiet guy. And then he, he would light up like a light bulb. Yes, that's right. It's exactly right. You know, and I said, okay, well, if he says it, then it's not my imagination. You know, and Chick has that as well. He has that, uh, that inner clock. Steve Gadd has that inner clock. Wow. Yeah. And Drummer. they have the ability. The ability to play against the time, syncopations without the time moving. That's it. And if you have that, then it opens up a whole new world, an yep. unbelievable world of what you can do it's rhythmically. So if you don't if you don't have it, then you are you are not gonna be as effective because the time's all over the place. Correct. Yes. Yes, that's true. That's true. W wanted to ask you if you if some drummer is playing with you, like a th even like a tabla player or any drummer, hand percussionist. What do you expect from him other other than having a good rhythm? What would you What would you expect from you know if you see the newcomer, the new drummer like me, and uh, keeping in your band? Well, the, the, you know, the way you were implemented and, and, and fit in the music was uh, more on the freedom side of doing what you felt, which yeah. is highly unusual. Usually I have parts, like in my own compositions, are much more involved, let's say. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when a section changes, uh, I have very specific things that I hear in my head because... 
The worst part about it is for, for other percussionists is that I'm a percussionist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know what I want. I know, I know what's going to work. And usually it's very unorthodox. And it's usually something that they, they just, some guys are like, wow, okay, you want, oh, okay, you want that? You want the, oh, you want the thing to start on the end of two? I said, yeah. <laughs> what you, I don't want you to play with your feel. I want you. I want you to play this pattern because it's going to fit like a glove, like this in the other hand. <laughs> you know, because you might have a different rhythm on the left speaker. And I always mix like George Martin, where I I separate. Uh -huh. Never put percussion and drums together ever, never, because it, you know that's that's only if you're playing the same thing. But then that's pretty boring if you play the same thing. Or you, or let's say if you play something that is totally like the standard. Okay, boom, boom, got, boom, 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 got, right. So I always hear rhythm that starts on very strange places. Mm -hmm. You know, and then it goes through, and then it might go to another section, and there's another thing. So the percussionist not necessarily has to read, although it helps, but they have to have an amazing amount of uh, recall ability. Ooh. Recall, because it takes a lot of practice. But my rehearsals are, are absolute clinics in a way, because there's a lot of uh, that goes into learning. Uh, what to play? It's so, so for the guys that like total freedom all the time. This is this is the worst gig on the planet for them. But for guys that want to take the music to a, another uh, place and are willing to let me, you know, show them, uh, yeah. then it it could be it could be something of a new experience. You know what I mean? That's true. That's so when when you have that left and the right speak and it's like this, not clashing together. Not when you're listening and it's just a mess. So you have to separate. Even if I have two different guitar parts that are syncopated, you have to separate them. Yep. And and I usually like to not have any two musicians playing, two music instruments rather, playing the same thing at the same time, mm -hmm. rhythmically. Yep. So yep. you have you have counterpoint at least, at least with three three different instruments, if not four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what? And wanted to ask you always. This is must be a very basic question, uh, but I always had my on my mind that why, why acoustic guitar and why the electric guitar? Is there any different purpose? What is your point of view behind it? What What do you think about these both aspects? Well, electric guitar uh, is not so much your, uh, you know, chordal rhythm uh, type of instrument. Because usually you have a setting to sing like like in a, in a kind of sustained fashion, mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's great for the vocal like lines uh, and for for lines that you want to just sing, you know. So uh, it's it's a different animal in that sense. Whereas the acoustic guitar uh, is it separates the men from the boys sometimes. Oh, okay. You know, you can't get away with, you can't get away with as much stuff as rock guitar players, let's say, have gotten away with because they use so much sustain and so much uh, volume in there and their amplifiers, and you can get away with a lot of little trickery, trickery. Yeah. You know, <laughs> there's, there's there's little trickery you can get away with with an acoustic guitar. You it, it really shows what your t picking technique is like uh much more so you know none of this tapping stuff mm -hmm. none also, of these hammer you know these <laughs> <laughs> these sweet picking things don't work beautifully for the for the guitar player that doesn't have the ability to have an amp to you know throw that sound out there so on the acoustic it just doesn't work as effectively i like when the notes hit me i that's why i love percussion percussion is is what it is. You can't right. slur on percussion. Right, it, yeah. It's a, it's a hit. It's a hit. And that's the way I view the guitar. I view it, and I've been known for my, since my early records to have a very punchy sound. I like to feel it in my chest, mm -hmm. like drums, like percussion. And, and, and my favorite players were always players 
uh, like Chick Corea, like Gonzalo, you know, and like Steve Gadd, that have a very articulate way of playing. Super articulate. Okay. Even if you played a mistake, make sure that mistake is loud and clear. I don't, I don't like when I hear, you know, it's kind of there, kind of not there. Bam, you know. And to ha- to to be a player like that, you 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 got to be a strong player. Well, when you <laughs> when you work with when you work with uh, like you said, when you worked it with a uh, lot of you know artists senior than you when you were in twenties and thirties. then uh, your uh, what your attitude was like uh, were you were you like little bit uh, you know, you know like hide hiding behind the scene or you were like up front and playing whenever you get chance to play was it like that or you were just like a little bit respectful and that social thing came into play and then you were little bit uh, uh, hesitant to play a solo or something like that what what your attitude was when you were like in 20s and 30s oh 20s and 30s i was i was already you know playing with as much power in fact i, I listened to my recording to 20s and 30s and i go god i don't know if i could play uh, with that same velocity anymore like, as i did then it was it was a it was a youthful uh, a supercharged energy and and super strong articulation that emerged However, when I was 19 and I just joined Chick Corea and I you know I had like two or three days to rehearse 11 page charts you know you know you're looking at music there's like wow. 11 page charts on your stand and um and my our first gig was Carnegie Hall sold out wow uh, <laughs> I was definitely I was definitely sh- shy and I was definitely you know a little scared and definitely not as here I am you know I was more like like this hiding in fact the stand was <laughs> i was i was standing up and the stand was as high as the top of my head so i didn't have to see the audience because i would have fainted <laughs> <laughs> but 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 that's how you grow uh fast you either will grow fast or you will fail right. so when god when god gave me the the football i had to run with it in the right direction or it was very easy to to say this is not going to work you know and even though i got encouragement from them when i was a kid i was still a kid and and uh i didn't think that i was uh up to the level of these already they were already giants and yep. uh you know i remember chick saying oh man you're doing great you're doing great man and i said Wow, this guy thinks I'm doing great. I know I'm not doing great. But you know what? I'm going to show him. I'm going to show him because I I actually one point more tried to get out of it. I tried to say, "Look, I don't I don't think I'm uh, really cutting it with you guys, you know. If, you know, maybe I sh- maybe you uh, you should let me go or I, you know. No, 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 no. You're doing great. You're doing great. and I looked at him and I go, "He's actually lying to me." <laughs> so not I said okay now I'm going to show him. I'm going to show him. So I, all I do is practice. And the, and the beauty of that that time in the 70s the beauty was for me no distraction. Wow. No no cell phones. <laughs> no computers. No Facebook. Girlfriend girlfriends were way second. <laughs> you know, it, it was all about practicing. it wasn't going out to restaurants it wasn't you know you know the big big problem today is we are addicted to our phones we are we're That's checking we're networking we're checking 5 million different things on the phones we, we it, can you imagine a life without a computer and a cell phone no but i remember and that's why those records back then were killer they were amazing and and the amount of practice time was triple much more yeah wow wow and uh, i get to learn a lot of a uh, lot of things about your attitude so that you know i can earn a little bit of what to do you know with when i play with the new artist or you know in the indian classical music when you accompany somebody you complement each other 
and when you drummer gets to play you play a little bit but it should be like a really strong like espresso when drummer gets to play so if you are playing with the artist uh, who is your age it's fantastic to you know collaborate and it's like what you got and what you got but when you're playing with the seniors there is a culture that you know you show respect and then move on and uh, whenever you get chance to play you you play whatever you want but it shouldn't be like too long or it shouldn't be too short it should be perfect right. so that that artist will book you again otherwise you're out of business <laughs> so so <laughs> so, many, <laughs> so many things those well, you have to do that one also i mean i mean in time you develop them you know your instincts get sharper mm -hmm. you know uh there's a whole lot of things when you listen back on your early stuff you know you go okay whatever it is i have now i had then <laughs> i just i just got i just got sharper with my instincts yes that's so like in other words if you listen to keith jarrett when he was 18 you can hear keith jarrett as he is now you could see that he had it then. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. I lot, uh, your favorite players, if you listen early on, you're going to hear that they had something very early on. They had, a, a, let's say, a gift. You want to use the word gift. You know, they had it. But for sure, your instincts uh, get sharper and, and, and you develop what you have uh, more, let's say. Yes. And, uh, you know, what I've developed, I know, is is my my composing uh, side of me has has grown exponentially. You know, it's, it's just much, much deeper into writing, uh, which is great. I mean, I mean, I think that's that's the thing that keeps uh, keeps me uh, more, let's say, on top of things and fresh. Uh, is that it's not just a, a practice of uh, technique mm -hmm. and things of that nature, but but also the the depth of the musician can be expressed and your feelings can be expressed through composition. Mm -hmm. And not everybody, not not all great players can compose. So so uh, this was really something that I wanted to uh, see if I could do and develop. And now I have. Uh, close to 30, 30 records that I, I'm happy with the development of how things have gone in that, in that regard. And, and what, to me, I mean, in a show, uh, if you have a cross selection of people in the show, not just musicians, but you have also, let's say musicians drag their wife or their girlfriend, or they have you know, people that are not so into uh, the nitty gritty of what we do technique wise, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or improvisation wise, let's say, you don't, if you, if you, the composition is interesting enough, you're going to hold everybody's attention. That's, that's true. important. That's true. Completely. And not to go too, not to go too long with the solos. And I think it's the downfall of a lot of jazz and jazz rock people is that they, they, they lost, uh, or can never really recognize that, um, the composition is what keeps the attention and yeah. not too long on one thing that, you know what I mean? Just know and just instinctively, okay, that this section that you've repeated 4,000 times needs to change, maybe 2,000 times, you know, it just, you have to have uh, a, you know, a composition that is interesting enough. And within the, within the composition, you have sections of which you can improvise but the improvised part can't go forever, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and the downfall of jazz is where everybody takes a solo. Oh my God, one of the, one of the, one of the curses is like everybody taking a lengthy solo for however long they want. Uh, that's great if you have, you know, some musicians in the audience, but, but what about the other people? You know, so, <laughs> you know, you gotta be very conscious of it. And then, and then there's the aspect of forgetting about the melody. Yep. And, and, and that's what the Beatles tribute is, is really uh, to, to get people to realize that sometimes the simplicity of a beautiful melody is far more effective than the complexity of 
uh, a long piece of really hard, but you know, intellectual music. Mm -hmm. The aesthetics, the aesthetic, the aesthetics of some of these Beatle melodies goes very deep and straight to the heart, and and that's just a reminder of, uh, well, to me, it's really an expression of of uh, you know what it was that grabbed me in the beginning, still grabs me now. You know, and everything in between that I've done was was like, whoa, it's like wild compared to, to the most important part. So getting back to the important thing, like the melody of Norwegian Wood. Da -de -da -da -da, -de -da 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 -da. The power of those combinations of notes is just does something to you physically. Yeah. You feel it. You feel it. It's so beautiful. Yep. It's just so beautiful. And it's, okay, it's simple. But you know what? It's aesthetically beautiful. So when you have elements of this in the music, and, and also when they recognize it, it's a great thing. You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know oh. a lot of, I, I see a lot of jazz guys doing a melody, and he's like, well, you know, and that was the melody. I said, what? <laughs> that was play the melody again. That's the melody. Yeah. Holy Christ! <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, I would like to see if there is any question or something from the uh, viewers. Yeah, that's it. Answer some questions. So, Brian Green is asking, freedom exists amongst barriers. What do you think is the greatest barrier to your creativity? The barrier to my creativity? Yep. <laughs> well, that's a very interesting question because yep. I have to think about it. Yep. Usually I don't have to think that much about it. Well, the barriers uh, are, if I have to think in terms of barriers, if I think in terms of where there's a block, a block <laughs> where I'm just not getting anywhere. Um, so I don't know specifically what he means. Is it a block in writing? Uh, a block in my creativity, let's say if it was a block where I'm just not getting anywhere with the composition, I have to then just give it some rest and go back to it. Um, but the best, the best is when, when the music is flowing out of you and I'm, it's coming out so fast, I just write it. And I don't even think about it, I just write it really quick. Oh, that sounds good, next, next. And, oh wow, that's great. And then, and then you just, you don't have this barrier. Yep. Now there's times in my life when I had the barrier, mm -hmm. and you just have to say, uh, give it a rest, you know. Or uh, I've written plenty of music in front of a TV. Okay. You, you want you want it, yeah. Because what happens is, you know, if you're so consciously writing sometimes, uh, and you're deep into your instrument, you might fall into a, a rep repetitive kind of thing where you you know oh you've done that before I've done this before I've done this before, but I found that uh, if you watch some movie or something that you're into hopefully you're into it and then you just happen to have your instrument in your hand you might find yourself playing something that you've never played before but your your tension is not there it's just you just you're watching it and then, and then you just go wow wait a minute what is that well yeah. that's interesting wow okay yeah. that might not have ever happened if you hadn't been watching the tv so uh <laughs> it's the, I know it's kind of a bizarre thing to say, but uh, more, I've done a lot of uh, writing where some wild things have come up on, on the instrument. And I say, you know what? Hey, this is something to develop. The sequence of that I just was fooling around with subconsciously, not conscious, because my attention was somewhere else. It came no. from somewhere, yeah. but it, you know. Yeah, sometimes anyway. you, just, you just play and it goes, it just, it just, it's done. And then you forget to write it down that music, you know, 
whenever uh, Indian classical teachers teach something, and uh, if you don't grasp, because it's an oral tradition, if you don't grasp, it's, it's gone. It's completely uh, out of it. So th there is one more question. Th Thomas Feely is asking, what was it like playing on the Prince of the Sea? Oh, well, I was really happy to have played with my, my uh, uh, a guy that I looked up to and I, I would follow him uh, in my high school years and I went to see him so many times play and then we became very good friends. Larry Coriel. Larry Coriel was, was really the father of fusion guitar. Uh, so after my whole big, you know, listening to rock and pop in the Beatles and everything, when the Beatles went solo and everything, I, I just wanted to go further with my instrument. And as I went further with it, uh, I, I discovered Larry Coriel, Miles Davis, all of those guys. And, but Larry was the first guy I heard blending elements of uh, all different kinds of elements into, into his, uh, obviously his bass was jazz, but, but you had the, a rock sound, you had, you had country elements, you had, uh, you know, there was really a, a fusion of sorts that I had never heard before. Uh, and this was even before John, I think John was, John McLaughlin was one of the guys too, but, but Larry, Larry and John were like the same age. So they're like taller uh, than I was. So the late great Larry Coriel uh, remained a very good friend, uh, in a way, a teacher. I actually took a lesson from him uh, or two. <laughs> I don't remember, but I, out in, when he had his farm in New Hope, Pennsylvania, I remember getting driven out there and uh, something. He was, you know, he was just, uh, uh, he was always, he would always say really nice things to me uh, all through my career. Mm -hmm. uh, like he said, I love, I, of all the people, I love your versions of, of Piazzolla. You, you do the best versions of Piazzolla than anyone that I've ever heard. And yeah, it's a nice, you know, for guys like that who, are much older and 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 don't have their ego uh, dominating them like like he he was always very complimentary you know to me uh, so I miss Larry so doing that with Larry was was really great I think there was a certain <coughs> magic to that track damn so we had like a, an electric guitar kind of. Uh, uh, duo at the at the end of that track that's really I remember was really great but I haven't heard it in a long time yeah yeah that was in at Electric Lady Studios in uh, in New York same place same room I I recorded Mediterranean Sundance with Paco oh oh wow yeah that's the that's the classic for all yeah. time for uh, you know all time favorite for everybody. Somebody's yeah. saying, I haven't seen you play on Ovation guitar. Do you tell us more about your guitars you play right now? Well, I play a Conde Hermanos. It's a Spanish-made uh, guitar, and it's, uh, they have an Aldi Miller signature guitar because I had them put a, an RMC pickup mm -hmm. in it, uh, which, which connects to a box like this. And through this box, this connects to uh, either an amplifier or a PA unit. And basically I can have, um, which I don't have hooked up now, but I have a separate outlet that connects to, uh, to a synthesizer mm -hmm. uh, where I have uh, live, I have the, the ability to blend in with a foot pedal, then uh, not only the sound of my guitar, but also the, well, the sound of my guitar is straight, but I can also blend in uh, the chosen sounds on this particular unit, which is a Roland VG88. And uh, that's what makes it special to have those kind of sounds uh, in, co in combination with a nylon sound. Mm -hmm. So I wanted, to go, I wanted to go to nylon, but it was a graduation. Yeah. You know, so Ovation, Ovation had a quicker response because it was steel string. Uh, I sometimes miss it, although on the track that you play, mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, the Strawberry Fields, that's all ovation. 
Mm-hmm. So, so I, I, I snuck the ovation back in again because sometimes I, I miss the, the, that particular sound that it has, you know. <coughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, one more, and uh, maybe we can take it as a last question. Maybe, what is your favorite composition you created? My favorite. Oof, that's tough. <laughs> I don't. I don't have a favorite, but I have several that I'm. Uh, there's too many. It's just too many. I have almost thirty records. Uh, I have uh, f- more famous pieces like Mediterranean Sundance. The the world knows. Yeah. You know? My but then I have. I have like deeper pieces of music that that are not as easily recognizable. Like I have a piece on, on an album that comes to mind, I don't know why, but from an album called The Infinite Desire. Mm-hmm. And there's a piece called Vizzini. Vizzini was a, a famous, uh, he's still around. Andrea Vizzini is an amazing painter. And I have a lot of his paintings in my house uh, from, from Italy, of course. Uh, he's actually from Sicily, but his his gallery is in Venice. Okay. Uh, and this is a a great piece of me. I think it it just turned out great. But I have a lot of pieces that, over the years, the music of Cielo e Terra was like a twentieth century uh, avant garde guitar record. I mean, it's uh, that's a special record because I can't play any of that music now. It's so hard. But I remember what it took to write it it took me taking the phone off the hook in 1981 or whatever it was for one month no oh. no one could no one could call me and i couldn't call out i wouldn't call out and i was living alone and i said i i'm going to write some serious stuff but it's going to require just no communication at all <laughs> The best thing I ever did. I wrote two albums worth of music. And Chilly Ted has some of the hardest guitar music I've ever written. Okay. Yeah. This is before cell phone, before computers. So that's what I was saying. I think that it's so much harder to practice with the same diligence or record a record. It's, it's, it's literally brutal. Luckily, I have my own studio, so I record when I want, how I want, and everything. But if you are on a clock, a time clock, and you have a, a cell phone, and you're working in someone else's studio, and you're paying, uh, the diversions of uh, focus mm-hmm. are mm-hmm. not what it used to be. It's yeah. just the way it is. It's the way it is. That's true. I mean, you, you, uh, you were in that era where there was just practice focus on like maybe 12 hours, 15 hours, you don't see the clock, what's happening and when is the night and day? Because- you, Like you, if I wasn't talking to you right now, I'd be practicing. You <laughs> <see>? <laughs> Sorry for no, stealing but, your time. <laughs> no, no, no. You know what, it, but, it, but it is, it does have the benefits. The benefits yep. is, it, it, you know, we can connect to the world. That's you true. Know, we, I did. I did a few streams uh, of myself and my my keyboard player, who's who's stuck here with me from Spain, mm-hmm. and and we were able to to reach uh, three hundred fifty thousand views. Wow! With countries like uh, you know that the most remote countries all over the planet, That's and true. and it was so powerful and 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 blew our minds that we did it. We did it again. I think there was two of them, I think. We did it again. And then I also debuted uh, a recording of John Paco and myself. Because behind this wall in back of me yeah. uh, is, is uh, where I store all my two-inch reels uh, from many, 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 you know, 40 years. So I had these tapes of uh, not only Friday night in San Francisco, because it's already released. But I have, we play two nights. So there's a Saturday night in San Francisco of different songs. Oh, okay. Wow. Wow. And it, it's so strong. Now, first I had to have them professionally baked, you know, by, by a guy that knows how to restore tapes. It's not like making a cake. 
Right, right. So there's a special kind of baking process to restore the audio ma magnetic quality or find out that it's, it's already destroyed. Mm -hmm. We have to find out through the baking process if it's there. And oh. we found out that the quality is still incredible. And there's enough of songs that people have never heard. So I, I debuted one of those pieces, uh, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, and uh, along with playing some new stuff that we're writing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really cool. Wow. So wow. the benefits uh, are, are extreme because of, you know, networking and, and connecting to the world and finding stuff out. And <clears throat> if you have any question in the world, just go to Google and, you know, uh, maps, trying to find the next gig. Just <laughs> put the date. I mean, we can never go back, but I remember what it was like uh, having, you know, pre-cell phones and pre-computers, the, the amount of time devoted to practicing was was far extreme, you know. Wow! Yeah, yeah. I I I do understand what you mean exactly because in my time when I was in school, same thing was there. There was no cell phone and internet for me in India. So I yeah. I rather go for a lot of concerts and you know go for the lot of gigs where masters are playing in front of us like every day, every day. Every day, Ustad Zakir Ustain, Ustad Alekbar Khasab, Pandit Ravi Shankar, Ustad Vilayat Khasab, they all were sitar players, saro players, they all were all over and we used to go and watch them in front of, sitting in front of them, never bought a ticket <laughs> because we used to think that this is our right as a musician, as a, you know, budding artist. We should watch, you know, that's, that's how we can learn. Otherwise, there is no way we can learn because there is no internet and there is nothing. Are you, did you watch Ravi? Yes, a lot of times. Did you meet him? Once, yes. Yeah, I met him once too. <laughs> he, came to, he came to see uh, uh, the guitar trio. <clears throat> I think it was the last time we played in Los Angeles at the Universal Amphitheater. Mm -hmm. And he came backstage and, you know, he came over to me and and I go, oh, wow, Ravi Shankar, you know, this is, you know, great honor. He goes, you play so fast. <laughs> he said to me, I said, oh, my God, that's all I remember. You play so fast. <laughs> he, he really loved the show. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course, of course. There are so many people saying hi to you from all over the world. I, I, I get a lot of messages. And it's... Uh, uh, which, country, which countries? They're, they're saying... Greece, Poland, Holland, India, a lot of message. Argentina, USA. Beautiful. Uh, and also one more, uh, do, Hong Kong, one more. And uh, Rana Karabudak, I'm really sorry for the name if I pronounce it wrong. Do you think the concerts will go on from June? That's what he's asking. If it starts from June or July, it's unpredictable, but what would you say? No, it won't go on. It, it, it's, yeah. uh, it's, uh, the foreign, the, the international shows uh, have been canceled mm -hmm. the, till the fall. And it's a very, it's devastating. But, you know, this is so serious what, what is out there. It's, it's, uh, it's fright. It's so frightening, you know. Uh, I just hope life can go back to to the way it was. But it's they tell they tell us it's not going to. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's. I'm I'm worried about. I really hope that people have the courage, let's say, to go to shows again without the fear that yeah. that yeah. they would be sick. Uh, there has to be, in my estimation. Uh, a brilliant scientist laboratory that, that develops a kind of breathalyzer uh, or some kind of test that could be done right at the door of the theater or the club. And it, it's just the way it is. Just like we're, we're used to going through metal detectors at, at airports, we, we should get accustomed to, uh, once they develop it, a kind of breathalyzer. You know, you're going into the show, you have a ticket, <sighs> breathe into the thing, uh, or, or some kind of, a, you know, slight little whatever they're going to have to do. 
that can immediately give you a result within a minute's time that shows right on a meter, okay, you're good, you're, you're showing no signs of being having the illness. Even if you're not showing signs, it has to show that you have the ability to transmit. Yep. So if you have the ability to transmit, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you can't come in. Yeah. And then if we have the security of knowing that uh, there is this kind of thing, I would feel 100% fine with with sitting in a crowd or playing on a stage. Right, right. You know, uh, but they have to develop this thing is and and there's no there's no real talk about it. Mm -hmm. But they have to have this kind of immediate testing for people that are showing no signs. That's Obviously, if you have a fever and you're and you're coughing and you're you're, you're you got a lung problem, mm -hmm. you shouldn't even be trying to come into the show. Uh, I'm talking about people with no they feel perfectly great, but they have the the actual virus yeah. that they can yeah. transmit, and not knowing they're transmitting it. So a hundred people in this club can get the virus because there's one guy. That can't. That won't make us feel safe to go back in. That's true. That's but, true. And so I'm very worried about this. Uh, I think the whole industry is panicking beyond belief. Yeah, that's the, it's it's uh, the entertainment industry and a lot of people who are you know, they, bread and butter is like daily life. Bread and butter. They are they are going to suffer a lot because this is gonna go for a year maybe. This year I don't I don't know it will be any possibility to have any concert or something like that because even if it's there there is a concert, there won't be audience because they will hesitate all the time like you said. It will be, it will be always. Well. Don't know. You know, it's it's hard to say. Like if the if the if we're here and in the, in the disease mm -hmm. goes all the way down, that that indicates that there's not so many people that have it. Right. 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 So, if we go through a lengthy period of time when mm -hmm. there, there's almost you know a very small percentage of people, it's like maybe one out of a million. I think we'll take our chances. Yeah, but yeah. if it's if it's one out of a hundred, mm -hmm. then we're not going to feel so comfortable. One out of a hundred, because because you don't want to be sick, you know, you don't want to be that one out of the hundred. But one out of a million, then you would take your chances. So there's also the gamble, you know, that uh, <laughs> it is. We just have to wait till it really subsides, and that it's not no longer a, uh, the threat that it was in this period. You know, but yeah. how is it in India, by the way? In India, it's social distancing is very hard because it's like uh, it's like New York, basically, the way you the way you live. So it's all buildings are together and everything is all together. People, are, it's it's not like America that houses are very you know they have, they have distances in between that. So it's crowded and population everything. It's very hard to keep uh, people at home. And there are a lot of things happening in India right now. It's it's terrible, but uh, but uh, our prime minister did the great job locking down the whole country and uh, not having anything. Uh, nobody is outside and having police on every corner, and uh, they are they are doing incredible job by their side. So let's see. Hope it will be okay in in a month or so. If not, then they, I think the lock lockdown will go a little, little bit further. Well, is your is, is your your summer is when uh, same as our summer and yes, but it's in okay. May, June, July. All right, so it's May, not, May, no, May, March, April, May. Uh, March, April, and May. So the the heat is going to be extreme. Yes. Uh, is that is that is that uh, uh, positive for staying inside where it's cooler hopefully or do people want to go out because the weather is nice people people don't they cannot go out right now because all right uh, so you're much strong you're much more stringent there yeah uh here here in america they're starting to get crazy they're starting to get, not not necessarily in new york city or boston but but i would say uh and i'm hearing about states like michigan and 
Minnesota and all that, they're, they're losing their minds and they, they absolutely are protesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. They, 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 you cannot hold us in, in and we're going out regardless. So they're having big protests. So the fear is that this thing could stay with us, mm -hmm. you know, unless they, they, and it could be a little bit of a, like a war, <laughs> you yeah. know, because they're, they're, these, this is a gun carrying country, the United States. That's true. <laughs> so I think they will, <laughs> it could get really bad, you know. Yeah. But let's, let's hope for the best. But it, Yeah, that's true. That's true. Let's hope for the best. Uh, uh, I want to end this conversation sir, on a really good note that uh, uh, if you, there are a lot of messages coming on Facebook and Mexico and a lot of places from all over the world I just saw. Could you at least plug the guitar and play a little bit for us? A little bit. Oh, let's see. What would you like to hear? Whatever you want to play, anything you you would like. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it sideways? Yes. Uh, yes. Now I can. We played it. Wow. so much sir Thank you. 
So amazing, sir. Yeah, but this is. Wow. 
a blessing for me and it's amazing wow the way you play it's, it's i can listen to it forever it's like written to forever <laughs> <laughs> right uh would you like to play sometime in india have you ever played out would you like to play and you know play a concert in india with the uh, indian artists or something like that collaborate it's one, it's one of the one of the places i haven't been to yet uh in all of these years, I, you know, I'm, I'm surprised I actually haven't been there, but uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Look forward to it. Yeah. I, I, we might, we might have some requests. So I'll, I can approach to people and I can get connected with you so that uh, we, we can play with, uh, you know, in India with collaborate with some Indian artists who are, you know, learning jazz and guitar and a lot of things. And okay. uh, yeah, the, that would happen maybe soon. Beautiful. Yes, yes. The, sir, the, on this note, I'm really thankful to you. My and pleasure. thankful to Stephanie. And uh, give my love to Eva. And, right. uh, <coughs> I will do. Lo a lot well, of love to, to see you. I mean, everybody stay safe and yes. healthy. And we'll get through this all together. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. The, the, okay.